Hello, and welcome to the 14th lecture in aerodynamics. Last time, we stepped away from math and theory for a study on the characteristics and design of airfoils. These are shapes specifically designed to produce lift with low drag, and their wing components. We covered basics, modern design, and controllability. Today, we're going to continue our analysis of a realistic foil study. Both pressure and viscous forces lead to drag on the foil, potentially hurting the flight efficiency. Special attention will be paid to separation, the root cause of pressure drag. So with that, let's jump in. Airfoil drag has been something we have talked about briefly, but haven't yet gone into detail on the root of its source. It is the force that needs to be balanced by thrust and predominantly dictates flight efficiency and fuel costs in flight. Up until this point, most of our theoretical exploration has been focused on deriving the lift and we've had success. By assuming flow is inviscid and incompressible, we could use elementary flows and panel methods to accurately predict the lift. However, these methods would not get us drag. Assuming inviscid and not allowing for flow separation, we completely ignore all drag-causing mechanisms in aerodynamics. In the past, we have explored where drag comes from. Recall our equation for axial force, which is similar to drag at a low angle. Loosely, it's written as the integration of pressure and shear distributions over a curve S. As a reminder, Pressure forces always act normal to the surface and are distributed stresses about a body. Shear forces, however, are stress distributions that are tangential to the body surface. The physical mechanism of shear force is predominantly viscous forcing, and pressure forcing over aerodynamic bodies comes from flow separation. Let's get started with viscous drag. First, we take a quick refresher on what viscous forcing is. Picture two train cars moving side by side at different velocities. If one of the passengers were to jump across the, to the other train car, they would bring with them a change in momentum. This change in momentum results in an acceleration of the train car, and as a result, force is produced. In fluids, the train cars are streamlines and the people are bouncy molecules. Near a solid surface, around a moving fluid, we have a boundary layer where flow at the wall is zero velocity. The boundary layer height is typically delta, and everything above the boundary layer can usually be safely regarded as inviscid, meaning viscosity is approximately zero. In the boundary layer, viscosity is important. As small fluid molecules bounce from one streamline to the other, they bring with them changes in momentum, which is a force. This velocity gradient near the wall is what imparts a shear stress on the surface. To apply viscous concepts to airfoils, right away in our analysis we're going to have to make an approximation. Let's assume that an airfoil is approximately a flat plate. Why? Because we know a lot about the development of boundary layers over flat plates. On curved surfaces, there are pressure gradients that make things much harder to analytically explore. Generally, this is an okay approximation if the foil is thin and at a small angle of attack. Let's go back to fluid mechanics and explore the flat plate boundary layer. Flow passes over a flat plate. Once it comes into contact with the plate, a boundary layer grows. Initially, it's laminar, or a clean parallel flow, and the boundary layer grows parabolically. Then. At some distance down the plate, which is at a critical X location, the boundary layer rapidly grows and the flow transitions to turbulence. Turbulent flow is unsteady, chaotic, and high energy. Both the laminar and turbulent boundary layers have velocity gradients at the wall and produce shear stress distributions that vary with X. This shear stress distribution integrates to a total drag on the plate. This is the drag that we're after. Analytically, we know the boundary layer growth and skin friction for both laminar and turbulent boundary layers. For laminar flow, the boundary layer grows as x over the square root of Reynolds number. 
Keep in mind that this Reynolds number is based on x, the distance from the star to the plate. And while we're thinking about non-dimensional numbers, also recall the drag equation, which includes the drag coefficient. The skin friction for the laminar boundary layer also grows as 1 over the square root of the Reynolds number. Note that because we're using flat plate relations, skin friction refers to one side of the plate. In aerodynamic flows, generally there's flow on both sides, so the drag coefficient of the body due to viscosity is twice the skin friction coefficient. Here we use the Reynolds number based on the cord for skin friction, since typically we care about the entire length. And for a turbulent boundary layer, the height and skin friction both grow as 1 over the Reynolds number to the 1 -fifth power. And again, this skin friction is only for one side of the body. It would be fair of you to ask, is this even a good assumption? Can we consider the foil as a flat plate? Let's gather up some NACA 2412 data at a Reynolds number of 3 million, cord of 1.5 meters, and we'll get a drag coefficient for measurements of CD equals 0 0.0068. If we used purely laminar flow, and the equations above with our conditions, we would find an absolutely tiny boundary layer height of 4 millimeters. Also, we would significantly under-predict the drag coefficient. For an entirely turbulent boundary layer, we'd get a little bit thicker boundary layer height at the back of the foil, and we would over-predict the drag coefficient by a bit. The laminar and turbulent assessments both assume that the flow from the beginning is either laminar or turbulent entirely. In reality, the flow naturally transitions from laminar to turbulence. The transition happens at a significant x value, which we need in order to accurately get the drag. So, how do we go about getting this transition location? We need the critical Reynolds number. Unfortunately, we cannot theoretically get at this critical Reynolds number. It comes from either experience, measurements, simulations, or we could look it up in a book. Once we've obtained it, by definition, the critical Reynolds number will tell us the critical x value, since all other quantities in the equation are known. Then, with the critical x value, we can get to the viscous drag. To do this, you need to calculate the drag on the laminar portion of the plate and the turbulent portion, and add them up. At this Reynolds number, we would estimate a drag due to friction of 0.0062, which is quite close to the real thing. Keep in mind that this estimate only includes the viscous drag, and the real thing, there's also pressure drag inside. This leads us nicely into the next segment, which is on pressure drag. Note, pressure drag is commonly referred to as form drag in aerodynamics. It is the imbalance of pressure due to separated flow. Consider flow over a NASA low-speed foil, which is an optimized modern foil with idealized pressure distributions. As flow passes over the nose and up the foil, it accelerates and experiences a favorable pressure gradient. A favorable pressure gradient means that flow is decreasing with downstream distance. Once it passes over the top, it slows back down due to an adverse pressure gradient, which means that pressure is increasing and in resisting the flow. Below, we can draw the distribution of pressure relative to the atmospheric pressure for the top surface. From the beginning, the pressure rapidly drops as the flow accelerates, it stabilizes, then increases more slowly. The gradient of this graph indicates either a favorable or adverse pressure gradient. Now, consider the same foil at a dramatic angle of attack. Flow passes over the foil, but the ankle's just too large and flow separates from the surface. The pressure distribution, in an ideal case where flow remained attached at this angle, it would be a massive drop in pressure that would then recover. However, in the real case flow is separated, and that results in a lower pressure peak, and the pressure quickly balances to a relative constant. 
The difference between the ideal and real case here represents a loss in lift because it is this low pressure on the top that derives the lift, and the separation was detrimental to that low pressure. I think it's important to briefly revisit why flow separates. Consider a boundary layer flow coming down a hill. This boundary layer is in the presence of an adverse pressure gradient, so the pressure downstream is higher than the pressure upstream. This pressure difference acts to resist the flow and tries to slow it all down. The flow away from the wall is fine. It can slow down because it has high energy. But the flow near the wall, which was already low due to the boundary layer, gets lower and lower and turns negative. Negative velocity, called reverse flow, is the primary indicator of separation. Downstream, this separation region grows. Bring back the NASA LS foil and we will consider the real pressure distribution and the impact on lift and drag. First, we draw the bottom pressure distribution. It's high near the nose, but relatively cons consistent downstream. On the top, we will start by drawing what the ideal pressure distribution would be. The pressure is much lower near the nose, which is where the primary lift is produced, and then it has almost a perfectly constant pressure distribution downstream. Unfortunately, the real pressure distribution is due to separation. There's substantially higher pressure at the top, and then a drop in the pressure near the back. From this diagram, the lift would be the integral of the pressure in the y direction from the top and bottom surface. Similarly, the drag is just in the x direction. There are two main characteristics of the pressure plot to point out. First, there's a substantial region of higher pressure above the foil surface, meaning a loss in lift. Second, near the trailing edge, the pressure has a larger component in the x direction, leading to added drag. So, we have two main characteristics of separated flow. There is a drastic reduction in lift, and this phenomena is called stall. You want to avoid stall during flight. Second, we have added a lot of drag, which ruins our flight efficiency. You might be wondering, when exactly does flow separate over a foil? How do we predict it? Unfortunately, there's no exact answer. The best we can do is recognize separation in the performance. Consider the lift curve of a relatively thin high camber foil. This is the NACA 4412. As the foil angles with respect to the flow, flow stays attached and the lift increases. Towards maximum performance, we see streamlines start to pull away from the surface, and then all of a sudden, performance plummets, which indicates separated flow. This is a specific type of separation, called leading edge separation. This happens with thinner foils and has a rapid performance decline. This is because the separation happens all at once. However, there is a second type of stall that's much more gradual. This is the trailing edge stall because the stall begins at the trailing edge and slowly climbs up the foil with an increased attack angle. Thicker foils tend to undergo trailing edge stall, and thinner foils tend to separate more rapidly. As you can see, we can find the footprint of separation in the performance. Unfortunately, it's a lot harder to predict ahead of time. Now that we have a better understanding of viscous drag and pressure drag, which one is more important? For fully attached flow, measurements and simulations indicate that viscous drag is the largest, somewhere around 80% of the total drag, though it depends on foil shape and flow condition. Once flow is separated, the pressure drag dominates. Interestingly, there is a way to use one type of drag to avoid another. Promoting flow turbulence can delay separation. Consider laminar flow over a foil that separates. If you were to add an instigator of turbulence, like a trip device, the flow could possibly remain attached under the same flow condition due to the added turbulence. This is because the energy in the boundary layer. A laminar boundary layer has lower velocity gradient near the surface, and much lower velocities near the surface. Turbulent boundary layers are much more energetic near the wall. 
It is this added velocity near the wall that means the flow is less susceptible to adverse pressure gradients, so it's harder to slow them down and reverse them. It's common to promote turbulence in cases where you want to avoid separation if flow isn't already turbulent. Okay, let's end on a practical note. Obviously, airfoil drag is something we need to consider and as an aerodynamicist. Two main aspects from today are the stall angle and the critical point at which flow transitions to turbulence. These are very important parameters and they cannot be predicted theoretically very well. So, this proves to be a point where we will continue to need measurements and simulations, meaning we'll always need an aerodynamicist to help us with things. However, you don't need fancy equipment to hunt these properties down. One of my favorite flow visualization techniques is tuft flow viz. Take little strings and tape them to the surface of your airfoil or lifting surface. If flow is attached, they will stay straight and steady. In separated flow, they'll wiggle and bounce, giving you a nice picture of where flow is separated where it's not. If you want to then remove this separation, you might do something like add a flow control device. A vortex generator, which are commonly seen on commercial aircraft, further promote flow attachment by energizing the boundary layer with vort vortices. This is a simple technique that can be done with limited resources. And that's it. Let's review. We started by reviewing the two sources of drag due to pressure and shear distributions. Shear stress comes from viscous force and can be accurately estimated as a flat plate flow. However, Knowing transition to turbulence is key in estimating the drag. Pressure drag is due to flow separation, and it's even more elusive. In reality, separation leads to dramatic loss of lift and increase in drag. Last, we explored how you can visualize separation and avoid it. I hope you enjoyed the video, and thanks for watching.